Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give a few seconds for everyone to, to get logged in here. And uh, I see the numbers are climbing, so uh, we'll do some housekeeping. And then uh, Dr. Saka is here. He'll do some introductions. So um, we're just going to give it a, a minute or two or a few seconds here as I see people getting logged in. So. As soon as we get a few more. We're about 50 seconds in. Let's see if we get a few more. In case you guys are wondering, we are going to be discussing uh, treatment of pain, opioid choices, and issues for the patient and practitioner. You did make it to the right place. We don't have that opening slide up yet. All right. It looks like we have just about everyone here. Um, if there is a refresh button at the top, uh, Go ahead and hit it if you get knocked out of the room. It will just say re-enter the room or refresh the room. And uh, this is not part of the CE program. We'll let you know when the CE program starts. We want to make sure that we stay compliant. Um, there will be a handout as soon as uh, Dr. Salka uh, does the introductions. Then uh, I will uh, launch a handout and it can be downloaded. Um, there will be polling questions uh, with regarding the uh, making this live and interactive. There'll be polling questions. Uh, the course is being recorded and there will be a replay sent tomorrow, probably tomorrow morning, um, usually about 14 hours. Just take some time for production and then it gets automatically emailed to everyone that has attended. Um, there will be a survey sent uh, in about two hours as soon as the program ends. Um, it's automatically generated, so please uh, fill out uh, the survey will be a link in the email. Uh, one way to really help this out is uh, Webinar Jams is a cloud-based service. Everything gets uploaded. So if you can uh, um, just decrease the bandwidth at your house or on your computer, one is close down applications. I know some people like to multitask and, and run other applications, but also people forget about uh, children and, 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 and family members in the house using Wi-Fi to maybe stream music. Um, it's usually on the user's end when the bandwidth at the computer starts and things start to lag. So if you can take care of that. And then uh, there is a chat feature uh, that will be uh, available and Dr. Salka will monitor the questions and we either take questions at the end or if he feels it's appropriate during the presentation, um, we'll take care of the questions. Tracy and I will, will answer them to the best of our knowledge. Um, Cope was gracious enough and Arbo was gracious enough to be able to allow us to do this type of education online. I think it's through June 30th. So we definitely want to stay compliant. We want to be interactive with the polling questions, with the chatting, um, and also make sure that in this two hour lecture, we do do an hour and 40 minutes. So we'll keep an eye on that. So with all that being said, Joe, looks like there's a lot of people in. Can you want to take over? Yes, uh, we're, we're very happy to be able to be doing this for everybody and we're certainly glad that you are attending. These are indeed special times and I, I know that uh, many state associations are allowing more online education, so we're happy to uh, have you attending with us. I'm going to introduce our speakers for the, for the evening, of course. Uh, already speaking in the introductions was Dr. Greg Caldwell who's in a private medical practice in Pennsylvania and, and along with myself is a co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants and uh, we are endeavoring to help people get their credit in this very special time. You know, Dr. Caldwell is a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and uh, he is uh, a nationally and internationally renowned uh, educator in eye care disease and is also one of the co-proprietors of OCT Connect. 
It's also my great pleasure to uh, introduce a close friend, Dr. Tracy Offerdahl. She attended Temple University School of Pharmacy in Philly for her undergraduate and graduate degree and her residency uh, at Temple University Hospital. For much of her time was spent in internal medicine and infectious diseases. She's very well uh, known in optometry and is well known to optometry education. She's currently on fac faculty at the Salish University in the Department of Optometry where she's the director and instructor for all systemic pharmacology courses for students in the optometry, audiology, and physician assistant program. Additionally, she's a practicing, practicing clinical pharmacist with a, with a pharmacy and a patient care practice in Rosemont, PA. She lectures extensively in the optometric community and she is a fellow of our academy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, our esteemed speakers, Greg and Tracy. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. And, and uh, Tracy, let's mark that uh, we're starting the CE program about uh, at least six minutes on the clock that I see. So we'll go to about 846 to be the minimum again to stay compliant here. And uh, everyone, thanks for, for being here tonight and, uh, and taking uh, the treatment of pain, uh, opioid choices and issues for the patient practitioner. As you can see, you have an optometrist and a pharmacist. And uh, I've been lecturing with Tracy for about three or four, maybe five years now, I'm starting to lose track, Trace, and uh, uh, it's been a, it's always been a pleasure to, to share the podium uh, with Tracy and tonight uh, a webinar uh, with her. So I always say I kind of get us to 30,000 feet and people want to talk to the pharmacist, they really don't want to talk to me as the optometrist. So, uh, uh, so uh, with that being said, again, uh, disclosures, I'll mention many products and instruments tonight. Um, I don't have any financial interest in any of these products, especially in these opioid arena. Um, as you can see, uh, I've lectured uh, for Shio, Biotissue, and Optivia. I'm not going to read this whole slide. You can see it there. I'm an advisory board for Allergan and Sun, PA Medical Director for Involve, which is a managed Medicaid um, uh, in Pennsylvania. Telesite, uh, up and coming, up and coming company. They've hired me as a consultant. Uh, tele, uh, telehealth. Um, I'm an ambassador for that, and as Joe mentioned, uh, part owner in optometric education consultants. Tracy? Nowhere near as exciting as Greg's, so I have just one financial disclosure. However, it's not really relevant to the opioid portion of this lecture. Uh, Boyron, which is a homeopathic company, and I have no other financial disclosures to mention. Great. Thank you. So here's the agenda. I'm not going to read this whole slide. I'll kind of skip over a few, but we'll talk about the crisis and definitions of pain and some grading scales and uh, allergies to opioids and the alternatives that are out there and drug reactions and tolerance and true addiction. And then uh, we'll get into some cases where opioids or ocular cases where opioids were used. And then uh, Tracy never and I never have any problems uh, using up our time, but hopefully we'll try and save some time here for questions and answers, and Joe will be monitoring right along there for us and can interject if something uh, seems to be uh, uh, to be pertinent at the time of the of the lecture there. So, uh, you know, here's really the crisis. I'm going to go through this pretty quick. It was in March of 2018 that the National Institute on, on Drug Abuse uh, released some of these uh, statistics. You know, about every day, 150, 115 people um, uh, in the United States die from overdosing from opioids and really in this uh, coronavirus, this COVID-19, you know, we're seeing more abuse of this type. So I'm not going to be surprised when this is all said and done if we see these numbers kind of start to climb and go back up. You know, I highlighted here, you know, it's a misuse uh, of, uh, uh, a misuse of the opioids. Um, it's really not our first crisis though. If you go back and you look at the time, you know, it's about every 100 years, almost like this pandemic, you know, the early 1800s, there was a United, there was a crisis in the United States. There's uh, one in the early 1900s, and here we are sitting, uh, you know, in the 21st century with another crisis. So, you know, kind of this, this ugly monster resurfaces its face every so often. And you can see there that's misuse alone, and it leads to billions of dollars within the United States of, of America here. So, you know, again, roughly 21 to 29 percent, again, misuse, and then 8 to 12 develop an opioid use. Uh, and then again, you see it's misuse, and then they transition into things that are stronger, like heroin, 
and about 80% of the people uh, who use uh, heroin first misuse prescription opioids. So, you know, we just want to draw attention, and this is where it came from, you know, started back, you know, uh, and you know, earlier before that, but actually, you know, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse March, these are some of the latest uh, numbers that are out there. So, you know, what happened in the summer of 2017, uh, the NIH met with pharmaceutical companies, and you're going to see some of the maybe innovative ways that they're trying to work. And Trace will talk about, you know, some of the medications and how they're a little bit harder to maybe inject and, you know, what happens. Uh, but that this was all came out of you know, meeting with the pharmaceutical companies, trying to do safe, effective, non-addictive uh, non strategies for basically chronic pain. And that's one of the really nice things about, you know, we don't want to be part of the problem as optometrists. Uh, but the nice thing is we don't really deal with the chronic pain patient. You know, we usually have to use an opioid and it's just for a few days. Um, so we're not a big part of the problem and our states have fought hard for us to get this. So, you know, we don't want to be scared, but we also don't want to be part of the problem uh, that's out there. So, yeah, and I, uh, the uh, HHS and I, uh, NIH are working together to try and help this out. Now, you know, pain, it's, it's important. It's part of our survival. Uh, it helps us to uh, remember those harmful stimulus, uh, to try to avoid them. So pain is not terrible. I remember Tracy on one of the, the, uh, uh, one of the talks, she said, you know, you have pain receptors everywhere. So, you know, that if you do get a tumor and it starts pushing on something that it, hopefully you get to, to, uh, to a doc and, you know, before it even spreads and maybe gets treated. So pain is not a bad thing. Um, uh, when it's out there, but always, off, obviously, whenever it's pain and they're all all there all the time, you know, it can then weigh on someone else. So, you know, pain provides humans with information about tissue damage and stimulus. Uh, there's it's a protective pathway uh, in two ways uh, that's out there. So remember, pain is not a terrible thing. Um, I like this slide here because it kind of shows you know how much of our brain. Uh, is is used for these different receptors. And if you just look at the little guy that's down there in the lower right hand corner, you can see that the you know the he's a little distorted and his hands are are big because a lot of the brain is used to use for hands and you can see definitely the head and the lips. And then obviously the body gets a little bit of of uh, a, a little attention. Uh, but there are pain receptors everywhere. And, and if you remember we have um, we have receptors for touch, temperature, proprioception, which is, you know, how we know where our body is uh, in, in our position. And then it's the nociceptive, which is now the, the pain. And there are different receptors out there, thema, uh, thermoreceptors, again, for heat and temperature, and the nociceptors for the pain. You have mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors, just as a reminder. So, again, pain is seems to get a bad rap. So I just put a few slides in here, you know, to, to remind us that, yeah, and, and chronic long-term pain can definitely create some, uh, um, uh, some harm to ourselves, and it definitely weighs on our mental status. But, you know, mental status is also a powerful way to influence pain. And the example I have in here is an athlete that twists an ankle, and really doesn't feel pain until the competition is over, or the soldier who's on the battlefield that gets a serious injury and is able to, in a sense, you know, carry two or three, uh, you know, other uh, soldiers off, and then they feel the pain. So uh, there's a lot of, you know, chemical receptors out there uh, that get influenced by pain. So that was just a quick reminder uh, of pain uh, that's out there and the pharmacology of pain. Remember, there's peripheral acting agents, and those are, you know, that substance P, that's, that's where your NSAIDs and ibuprofen fall. And then we fall in at the bottom there, your central acting agents. And now these are the opioids and narcotics, which we'll be talking about, and Tracy will really weigh in on those here very shortly. And then you have your uh, signal inhibiting agents. And those are your anesthetics and, and things like preparacaine. They inhibit uh, and prevent that signal. Uh, from reaching uh, to where it needs to go. There are different pathways out there. And as you can see in this picture, there's a person here who has their, their finger near the, fl the, the flame. Um, so obviously the receptors go up 
into the brain, tell the brain what's happening. They feel the pain, but there's also, as you can see, that real quick loop there uh, so that it doesn't have to go up into the brain and say, oh, look, my hand's burning, go back down. When, it, when certain receptors are triggered, it goes right back out in the muscle and it helps you to remove your, you know, your hand from that harmful stimulus that's there. And I always like talking about peripheral acting because that's when we start getting into synergism. We can start talking that the peripheral acting uh, is out in the periphery in the sense where that candle is in our fingers. And there are, uh, in the case there, it says aspirin acts here, but we don't use a lot of aspirin. So that would be where your uh, acetaminophens or your ibuprofens would work. And we talk centrally acting about, uh, in a sense, central acting the spinal cord, but these, it's just not spinal cord and brain, remember, there are central nervous systems all the way out into our arms and into our legs. And, but this is where those receptors get tickled in a sense from the, uh, from the narcotics. And Tracy will talk about these different receptors, particularly the mu receptor uh, that starts to get tickled. And then you see how it creates uh, part of this uh, sensation that the patient likes. So let's jump into polling question uh, number one here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch it. Um, and everyone pay attention because this is part of the interactive, so please respond. I'm going to launch the polling question, and it is launched now. Um, we have to give about 20 or 30 seconds for everyone to weigh in. And, and it says, what type of pain does not respond well or at all to pharmaceuticals? Is it nociceptive pain um, or is it neuropathic pain? Which type of pain does not respond well or at all to opioid pharmaceuticals. And I can see people are weighing in and it, uh, it's jumping around and you guys can't see it on your end, but uh, Trace, can you see the? Uh, yes. Can you, can you see the answers there? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to uh, end the poll here. And uh, we have about, uh, people are weighing in, and about 40% saying no receptive pain and uh, about 60% saying uh, neuropathic pain. So we have uh, nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. So let's just go back to the slides. And Trace, you wanna take over the different types of pain that's out there? Sure. And make any comments on anything that I've covered so far. So go right okay. ahead. So as Greg was mentioning, there are different types of meds that work on different types of pain. So the question that asked about what type of pain does typically not respond well to opioid uh, pharmaceuticals, it is in fact neuropathic pain, this second one down here at the bottom. So nociceptive pain is normal processing of pain. Uh, things like you, you chop your finger off, your finger hurts. You hit your head, your head hurts. The nice thing about these is they do respond well to most types of pain medications, both the non-opioids, those that are working more peripherally, including N and acetaminophen. That's a good then we move to our neuropathic pain, and we see here that this is abnormal processing of pain. And many times these things go together hand in hand, particularly in a chronic pain patient. So neuropathic pain is abnormal sensory input by either the peripheral or the central nervous system. And it's important to mention this here just to kind of complete the entire equation in the sense that, you know, as Greg mentioned, you don't get involved really in chronic pain management but you have patients coming in that are chronic pain patients and you may look at their list of meds and think holy cow how can they be on five different uh, medications some of them controlled some of them opioids and it just seems like a litany of of different types of pharmaceuticals and the patient says oh those are all for my chronic pain syndrome that's because an appropriate pain management um, med list includes things that we call adjuvant analgesics so sort of the atypical typical meds for atypical pain, sleep aids, nerve pain meds, muscle relaxers, anti-seizure drugs like gabapentin. You see this in your patients, uh, neuropathic pain in the case of like a, a herpetic, uh, a herpetic infection around the eye or you know a shingles infection where a patient may end up with acute and more chronic neuropathic pain. Let's see. 
So drug treatment options, again, just to kind of outline real quickly what we're going to go through today. Um, I wanted to mention, and I, I did hear a little bit, in terms of chronic pain patients that are coming in, we're going to hit the opioids and some of the non-opioids most specifically today. But these add-on medications for a neuropathic pain patient are important to mention, again, because it's a long list of medications for most patients, and also because some of these medications do have addiction potential. So you could have a patient who comes in that, that might be taking medications for chronic pain and, you know, they're coming in and saying, you know, oh, I have this problem, acute problem from an ocular perspective that's causing lots of pain for me. And you're going to have to be able to look at their list and think, does it interact? Is it going to trigger potential addictive uh, uh, characteristics in this patient? So... Some of these meds that have addiction potential include our anti-seizure meds, as well as our benzodiazepines. All of these work on the GABA system, so they're sort of what we call downers, much like the opioids. But the other thing to mention here, you see gabapentin uh, right here in the middle, Neurontin. It is now a controlled substance in about seven states, most, mostly in the southeastern United States, and gabapentin, Neurontin, was never a controlled substance federally at all. Now some states are deciding that it does have addiction potential, and it surely does. Pregabalin Lyrica is a, a baby brother of gabapentin, and that is a Schedule IV controlled substance. We also have anti-anxiety and maybe sleep meds that these patients will be on. So we have to sort of build this picture of what you have to be very careful to watch for if you are going to give a patient an opioid uh, to, to any extent, whether it's just a dose or a couple of days, we're going to have to be cognizant of that. Look at some of our chronic pain syndromes that occur. The list is huge. I'm not going to go through it all, but trigeminal neuralgia, diabetic neuropathy, phantom limb pain. You can get pain from chemo, HIV, autoimmune disease, migraines, fibromyalgia. And then over here on the right, you just see some of our antidepressants that are used chronically for chronic pain, and then some of our anticonvulsants. The list is long, and it continues to grow every single day. So if a patient uh, comes in, you know, and your front end staff has entered uh, their meds into the system, and you're not sure why this patient is on, uh, you know, Cymbalta or Imipramine or whatever the case may be, ask them if you know them to be a chronic pain patient, because they're probably taking quite a few of them for some dynamic associated with chronic pain. You know, another thing I'd like to point out here real quick, Trace, is that, you know, we're supposed to try and help, uh, you know, avoid uh, addiction and, and maybe being bullied into prescribing medications. And another reason to know that neuropathic pain doesn't respond to opioid is because a patient might come in and they might say, look, I've tried all that other stuff. Can you at least try and give me, uh, you know, some type of opioid here? I'd at least like to try it, you know, in a sense. And at least it gives you the, the, uh, the knowledge to know that, you know, that the opioids don't work on that pathway. Yeah. And if they, that, that, and that's a great point because we could give opioids to treat neuropathic pain, but you'd have to give a patient such a high dose that they would just be completely gorked out. And, you know, I mean, that level of opioid, uh, drug levels in a patient's bloodstream would treat pretty much any type of pain. So that that's a very uh, important point. So acute versus chronic pain, uh, acute patients coming in with, with acute pain, I should say, th that's where you're really going to have an impact and where most of this information will be valuable to you. Um, where you treat most of the time as optometrists, it includes acetaminophen, it can include uh, also NSAIDs and it can also include our opioids. So you might choose to use one of those, acetaminophen or a non-steroidal or an opioid. And in some cases you might use all three of those and that would be a, a great choice for some patients with acute pain. Chronic, we do the same list, acetaminophen, non-steroidals, opioids, but then again, we have additional medications that we're adding on to that list. 
Next, we have just goals that are going to be slightly different between an acute pain patient and a chronic pain patient. And this is an important clarification or just sort of a foundational point so that you understand when a patient with chronic pain is sitting in your chair, why they might still be uncomfortable sitting there and saying, oh, it's been a bad couple of days. And the reason is our goals are different. So for a patient with acute pain that might come and see you for an acute pain episode, the whole purpose is to try to treat that pain as best as possible. If we can get it down to zero, that's great, with the fewest adverse effects or side effects possible. With chronic pain, it's a little bit different. Most patients with chronic pain are never going to be pain-free. And the goal of medications and this long list of medications in a lot of chronic pain patients, the goals are, are essentially to kind of get the patient back into activities of daily living, to mother, to work, to, you know, to do gardening, just to get up and, and do the things that they love to do so that they're not sedentary or bedridden. And uh, that usually does not include taking pain down to zero. And that's a tough thing for chronic pain patients to to kind of, you know, grasp at the beginning because it's it's a lot to handle mentally and physically and emotionally. So with acute pain and chronic pain patients, it's a subjective uh, situation. You know, you hear some people have really high pain thresholds. Other patients have very low pain thresholds. So we're listening to a patient describing, oh, I'm, I'm in so much pain. And you kind of look at the scenario and think, oh, I'm not sure they're in that much pain. And Greg always says, you know, does the punishment fit the crime in the sense that, you know, it is their presentation matching what they're suggesting as uh, how much pain they're in. So with that subjective amount of information, we do have a little bit of information that adds some objectivity to the assessment, and that's our pain scales. So uh, just, you know, a real quick comments to make, we're not suggesting at all that we need to look at every patient and think, oh, sure, you're in pain. Of course, you are going to say it hurts like crazy, etc. No patients should needlessly suffer. But these are just tools that we can use as medical professionals to kind of add a little bit of an objective assessment to the scenario. So I just Googled when we were putting together this lecture, uh, I just Googled pain assessment scales, combination scales. And this is one of the best ones that I've come up with just to show you that they're widely available. I like this one because it gives us the numbers across the top, zero being no pain, 10 being the worst possible pain. It gives us colors, green is good, red is bad, yellow, orange is in the middle, and it gives our descriptors at the bottom. Zero is no pain. One to three is what is the medically acceptable range for mild pain. A four to six is the medically acceptable range for moderate pain. And then seven to nine or seven to 10 would be severe pain. And you're going to see those numbers again. And that's what you should use in assessing a patient's pain on the pain scale. It helps us determine what types of medications might be beneficial to them uh, from an acute pain treatment perspective. And it also also gives descriptions to the patients. If they're saying, oh, I'm definitely an eight, and you think, oh, you're looking more like a four in terms of what I can see, it's important to sometimes have the patients read the description so that they truly understand uh, what, what these numbers mean and, and, you know, how severe the pain might be. Oh, so let me play the video here. Tingling fingers? Never going to happen. What about a growth? So? What have you been working on? I'll show you. Duct tape? <sighs> Hate to break it to you, bro. Already been invented. Hey. Oh, dude! Ow! Oh. This is what I've been working on. Hello, I am Baymax, your personal healthcare companion. I was alerted to the need for medical attention when you said, ow, a robotic nurse. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your pain? Physical or emotional? I will scan you now. Scan complete. 
You have a slight epidermal abrasion on your forearm. I suggest an antibacterial spray. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's in the spray specifically? The primary ingredient is bacitracin. It's a bummer. I'm actually allergic to that. You are not allergic to bacitracin. You do have a mild allergy to peanuts. Hmm, not bad. You've done some serious coding on this thing, huh? Uh-huh. Programmed them with over 10,000 medical procedures. This chip is what makes Baymax Baymax. So I just thought that was cute. That's, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Big Hero 6. Uh, we get asked, I uh, got asked a lot the last time. That's right off of uh, YouTube. We're able to embed links in here. So Big Hero 6 uh, pain assessment, and uh, you can watch the rest of that video uh, that's out there. Again, Big Hero 6 pain scale uh, video. So I thought it was pretty neat how Disney picked up on using pain scales there, Chase. So I, that's why I wanted to kind of put that in there. So. Yeah, and if we all had a Baymax, we wouldn't need pain scales because he would know if we weren't telling the truth. He hey. wouldn't know, tell us exactly our number. So with that, uh, just going into the meds specifically now, we've got our non-opioids, our acetaminophen, our non-steroidals, and we can't forget glucocorticosteroids for certain types of pain. And again, we're looking at these from an individual drug use perspective, but also a synergistic potential when we mix them with opioids. So down here at the bottom, we're going to kind of pay special attention to codeine, hydrocodone and tramadol uh, because those are the three true opioids that most optometrists have at least uh, two of the three or in some states all three of those in your arsenal for treating patients with acute pain. So just a quick refresher on the Food and Drug Administration Drug Enforcement Agency Controlled Substance Schedule. Schedule 1, we will mention briefly marijuana and CBD, but medical marijuana, LSD, mushrooms, ecstasy, heroin, uh, etc. fits into the Schedule 1 uh, or C1. DEA controlled substance schedule. So for the most part, the federal government says these have no medical use. So we are going to call them schedule one, which means they're for research purposes only. Notice medical marijuana and the federal government obviously has kind of kicked that back to the states, which is appropriate to say, you decide as individual states what you want to do with medical marijuana and CBD, etc. cetera. So uh, did, not everything fits there perfectly. It's just a category that says it's really for research only. In the states where marijuana is allowed, the federal government kind of just, you know, turns their head to the side. It's still a Schedule 1 uh, federally. Schedule 2, this is where we're going to spend our time. Uh, as we move up in number, we decrease the addiction potential. So for instance, I'll just orient you to this line here next to Schedule 2. It says more likely to be abused as compared to Schedule 3 four, and five. So these are our true narcotics. We'll go through some of these. The only one that's in this list that you may have the ability to write a prescription for is the second one, hydrocodone. Uh, most notable brand name of that is Vicodin. And in some states, you can still write for uh, hydrocodone containing products, despite the fact it is a schedule two now. Our ADD medications also fit into that category. Our Schedule 3 drugs, again, safer, less likely to be as abused as compared to Schedule 2. So it just kind of splits hairs as it goes through each of these categories. But in Schedule 3, this is where you're going to see your acetaminophen mixed with codeine or uh, aspirin mixed with codeine. So that may be an option uh, for a patient of yours. And then Schedule Amidol, great choice out of patients and our benzodiazepines as well as our sleep agents. We decided to you know, make sure you could see that the benzodiazepines and drugs like Ambien are in that list as well so that you remember that they are controlled substances and that it can be problematic to mix more than one controlled substance. So we just wanted to remind you of that. And then Schedule 5 would be codeine uh, expectorant or codeine mixed with an antihistamine. It's a Schedule 5 rather than a Schedule 3 just because the codeine Codeine concentration is lower per individual dosage unit as compared to what we use for pain.
So uh, state by state restrictions, just real quick, I already mentioned marijuana, which is Schedule 1 controlled substance federally and states can decide. Hydrocodone, this is why some states can still uh, use hydrocodone products. It was, uh, or part of the reason, it was moved from a Schedule 3, so for almost 40 years, hydrocodone products, including Vicodin, were Schedule 3. 2014, the DEA said we're moving it to Schedule 2, which was appropriate. It, it makes it harder to use for mid-level practitioners, but nonetheless, it now sits squarely with the other opioids, which is appropriate. Some states do have the hydrocodone exception, or I think it's sometimes called the hydrocodone fix, and New Jersey is an example. So their uh, iDocs can still write prescriptions if they have a DEA license for Vicodin, uh, which is a hydrocodone-containing product. So a little information about the drug classes in general that we call opioids or narcotics. We know that these have long been mainstay of treatment for multiple different types and levels of pain. No maximum daily dose limitation. That is maybe surprising to some of you. It's also, uh, you know, terrifying, truly, uh, in some scenarios. You can have patients on a, a couple of thousand milligrams of oxycodone, a couple, uh, you know, 1,500, 1,600 milligrams of morphine. And oh, by the way, if you broke your femur and went into the ER, they would give you two milligrams IV push of morphine. So how can somebody be on hundreds and hundreds of milligrams of morphine? morphine and still living, breathing, and walking. Well, we'll talk about why that is. These are useful for both acute, acute and chronic pain. And as Greg mentioned, these are plugging into receptors that are also being used by our endogenous opioid substances. So our, our own opioid chemicals that plug into these receptors when uh, we experience pain are our endorphins, dynorphins, and kephalins. So when they're not enough, we have our opioid drugs that plug into these receptors. So pharmacologically and mechanistically, our opioids relieve pain and induce euphoria in most patients by binding to these opioid receptors in the brain and spinal cord. So I just want to show you very quickly, we have mu, kappa, and delta receptors. Mu uh, has already been mentioned, and this is our primary target for pain management with our opioids. But look what else happens when, we, when our opioids plug into mu receptors, which Greg already mentioned exist from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet and everywhere in between, because they're, a sur they're part of our survival if something goes wrong. Not only does mu receptor uh, affinity with an opioid give us analgesic potential, but it also gives us that euphoria that most patients patients experience when they take an opioid, appropriately so. But then we see the meiosis, sedation, constipation, respiratory depression, and addiction potential. So you never have the good without the bad when you have medications of, of any type. It's just that sometimes the, the side effects or toxicities can be much more severe. Our kappa receptors, when the opioids plug into those, you get analgesia, diuresis, sedation, meiosis, dysphoria, psychomimetic effects, respiratory depression, and constipation. So a lot of similarities, but a few differences as well. If a patient has more kappa receptors and they take an opioid, they may have that dysphoric or psychomimetic effect where it's a terrifying experience. It gives them nightmares. And usually those patients are less likely to have an addiction issue because they don't want to be terrified all the time. And then our delta receptors give us the analgesia as well. It's important to mention these so you see the side effects along with uh, the purposes of these opioids, which are to, to treat a patient's pain, but also because it shows us why codeine is different than oxycodone and hydrocodone and how morphine is different than hydromorphone and tramadol and everything in between. They all work a little bit differently and have a slightly different affinity at each of these individual receptors. If they were the same, we would, you know, we would only need one drug. So they're all a little bit different as it pertains to plugging into these receptors and sometimes other receptors in the body.
It's important to mention uh, just the differentiation between immediate release products and our controlled release or long acting products. So as optometrists with a DEA license, if you're going to be prescribing a dose or a couple days worth of an opioid or opioid like substance, you'll be using our immediate release or short acting medications. They're also known as breakthrough meds and I'll explain briefly why that is momentarily. So uses for our immediate release, acute pain or breakthrough pain, and our examples that would be relevant or you might already know, Percocet, Tylenol with codeine, Tramadol, Vicodin, all the drugs that you probably recognize already because you've taken them personally after a surgery or an injury, and maybe you've used some of them in your patients. Controlled release medications are also known as long acting or sustained release or extended release. And I'm going to show you uh, quickly as we go through the meds some examples of those so you can recognize their brand names in your patient's profile when they um, are giving you their list of meds. But the difference between our controlled substance or our controlled release substances, long acting, uh, extended release, all these different otherwise known as um, names, these are used to to give basal control of pain, typically in a chronic pain patient. And what we mean by basal control is, you know, a patient wakes up in the morning and they, you know, they have pain all day long. So they wake up in the morning and at 6 a.m. they might take their OxyContin, which is long acting oxycodone. The purpose of it is in about 45, 50 minutes, they're gonna have nice level nice even levels of the oxycodone over 12 hours. And then 12 hours later, they probably are going to take another long acting opioid like OxyContin. Gives nice level amounts throughout the day, basal control of their pain. If they should have acute pain on top of that chronic pain or basal pain, then that's when we would also add an immediate release product like Percocet or Vicodin or Tramadol or Tylenol with codeine. So chronic pain patients that come in and sit across uh, from you in their chair, in your chair, you'll notice they will actually um, be on both long acting and short acting and it's very appropriate to do so. So let's just run through some of these products so you can see kind of quickly how they compare. We won't spend too much time on them, but it's just going to give you a background on some of their differences. Morphine is the standard to which all other opioid products are compared. It was one of the first products to come out and, you know, really became important and popular for use in um, the Second World War. We compare all other agents to it uh, in milligram and microgram amounts as well. There are lots of different brand names that you will see for morphine products. So I'm just going to kind of differentiate for you what we just saw, which was the immediate release versus the, the sustained release or long acting. So MSIR is one of our most popular, widely used immediate release morphine products. And you can tell by the brand name, it's MSIR. That's literally the brand name of, of morphine sulfate immediate release. So you can tell that that would be something that somebody would use for acute pain. And then we have these three at the bottom, MS Contin, it's typically given 8 to 12 hours apart, Cadian lasts 12 to 24 hours, and Avenza lasts, one, one pill lasts 24 hours. So you're going to see chronic pain patients coming in on different types of morphine. Not every chronic pain patient has, has pain 24 hours a day. They may only experience pain while they're awake or while they're sleeping. So they wouldn't need one that lasted for 24 hours. Hey, Trace, does the CR stand for chronic release? Is that what that, yeah, Control immediate release? release. Yeah, controlled release. Controlled release. Yep, oh, so the IR Perfect. is immediate release and the CR is controlled release. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Then we have our hydromorphone products. You can tell that it's structurally related to morphine. Um, this product is more potent than morphine. Other than fentanyl, hydromorphone is one of our most potent opioids that are, that are available. So I just wanted to show you how we can compare these uh, to one another. Just so you see, if we give a patient 30 milligrams of morphine and wanted to switch to hydromorphone, they would only need 8 milligrams of hydromorphone. So you see 
that that's a more potent drug because you only need eight milligrams of hydromorphone to give the same pain control as 30 milligrams of morphine. And when you hear, oh, that's a really potent opioid, when you hear even news stories or sometimes on those police shows, that's what they're referring to are these different potencies that require a certain milligram or microgram amount compared to morphine to give the same pain control or even the same amount of high. Then we have our codeine-based substances or products. We have codeine, uh, which we'll, you'll see is mixed with Tylenol as our most popular product, and that's a Schedule 3. Then we have hydrocodone and oxycodone. Those are both Schedule 2. So of the five drugs that I just quickly mentioned, morphine, hydromorphone, codeine, hydrocodone, and oxycodone, only one of them is not a Schedule 2, and that's codeine. That's why it's a product that is widely used in uh, mid-level practitioners with, the, with a DEA license. So codeine, I have a little bit more information on this simply because it's a product that you may choose to use. Look at the, how weak it is. And in my world, that's kind of you know how we're comparing things and saying, well, you may want to use codeine because it is a more weak analgesic. On the flip side, we may say to a different scenario of pain control, acute or chronic, you may not want to use codeine mixed with Tylenol simply because it is such a weak analgesic. You'll need a lot of it. Maybe we want to use something more potent. So we just saw the comparison of morphine to hydromorphone. Look at this comparison on the first line. 30 milligrams of oral morphine is equivalent to 200 milligrams of oral codeine, which would also imply or mean, by the way, that eight milligrams of hydromorphone is also equivalent to 200 milligrams of codeine. That's a lot of codeine. And we don't typically dose patients that high over over the course of the day. So you see here in the products under acetaminophen or aspirin as schedule three products, Tylenol number three is big and it's bold and it's the most common product used if you want to use codeine as a pain control medication. Each tablet has 300 milligrams of acetaminophen and 30 milligrams of codeine. And I also always like to mention if you're going to use Tylenol with codeine, choose Tylenol number three rather than Tylenol number two or Tylenol number four, only because you're pretty much guaranteed that pharmacies will have it. Tylenol number two, Tylenol number four, never were as popular. And um, there's a good chance if you put that on a prescription and send it over, the pharmacy is going to have to order it. And then you sort of lose the benefit of the patient having a drug for acute pain. They'd have to wait a day or two for it to come in uh, the pharmacy order. Anything to add there, Greg? Another, no, nothing other than the, uh, that you'll hear it called T3. You'll hear them kind of say, oh, yeah, put them on some T3. And that's what they're re referencing. So They're not referring to uh, thyroid hormone. They mean <laughs> Tylenol number three. So oxycodone. Uh, these are some of the most popular drugs used out there, both recreationally and for pain management. Our most popular immediate release or short-acting product with oxycodone is Percocet. You can even tell by the brand name that this is oxycodone and acetaminophen because you have Percocet at the end, end C-E-T, and it's acetaminophen. You have that A-C-E-T. So kind of clever brand name. And Acet is just another kind of branded generic, as we like to call it in my world. Most common strength that we see used is the 5-325, just to show you how it's mixed with acetaminophen and lots of different strengths, um, although some of those have changed. Some say that oxycodone, they believe, is more addictive than heroin. And I would say in some patients that I agree with that. And Greg already mentioned that many patients who, who move to heroin or, or are heroin addicts will say that they started their journey by using prescription opioids. So, you know, everybody's different. Their genetics are different and their, their dopamine reward system in their brain is different. So one drug might cause a, a worse addiction or a faster addiction than another opioid in patients. You can see here at the bottom, comparing it again to morphine, oxycodone is more potent, and you'll see that hydrocodone is the same. So we have some drugs that are available to patients that are actually more potent than morphine, and yet you hear a lot of practitioners say, oh my gosh, I would never want to prescribe morphine or put a patient on morphine. Well, it's really 
kind of a, a silly thing to say because they all have addiction potential and we can dose every single one to give the exact amount of analgesic potential. We were alluding to this earlier, show you, and new coming out on the market. Surprising because, you know, we are square in the middle of, of another opioid crisis. But the purpose of most new products that come out that are in the opioid category is they are new formulations to help control abuse. So here's a good example. This is oxycodone continuous release, oxycontin. You can tell by the name, it's long acting, oxycontin continuous release. On the right hand side here, this was the original uh, formulation. When patients would have a, a a um, oxycontin tablet and they would smash it either with a glass a rock a spoon whatever it would it would um, get smashed into or, or you know move into a very very soluble powder on the left is the newer formulation of oxycontin the purpose of it is that it is less adulteratable which should translate into less potential for abuse. But where there is an addiction, there is a way. So despite the fact that manually crushing the new OxyContin, you see how it just sort of flattens out, it doesn't really go into a soluble powder. The next slide shows us that um, you know that this does help in some uh, to some extent over here on the right was the original formulation of oxycontin when it was manually crushed into that powder and added to uh, water added to it you could suck it up into a syringe and then inject it fairly easily on the left hand side this was the new formulation of oxycontin I showed that picture where it's manually crushed it just sort of flattens out because it is coated with a gel like substance if you try to add water um, or some sort of water soluble liquid to it, it turns into a gel that you cannot suck up into a syringe. But fun fact, two things patients will do if they're addicts. One, they'll suck on the OxyContin and get rid of the gel like coating that's on the outside. So just as easily to just as easy to abuse it as the original formulation or they'll add a little bit of alcohol or something that that uh, more easily puts this substance this gel like substance into solution and that easily is sucked up into a syringe and there are all kinds of blogs available out there that you know just pages and pages and pages of, of uh, commentary for people saying hey here's the greatest new way to abuse the new oxycontin or fentanyl or tramadol it's it's alarming hydrocodone kind of wrapping up our true opioids here our immediate release products are those mixed with acetaminophen apap uh, same thing and you recognize some of these brand names norco vicodin and lortab Something happened uh, around 2011 or through 2012 with these products like Percocet, like Tylenol with codeine, like Vicodin, Norco, Lortab. The products that were mixed with acetaminophen. You see here under hydrocodone plus acetaminophen and then hydrocodone plus ibuprofen. I, I put that in there to tell you not to use it. Nobody really uses that product. But Vicodin originally had five milligrams of hydrocodone and 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. Between 2011 and 2012, the Food and Drug Administration said, no, nope, too much acetaminophen. We're lowering the recommended max daily dose by 25% and we are mandatorily uh, telling drug manufacturers that if you have acetaminophen mixed in with something else in prescription products, you can only have up to 325 milligrams of acetaminophen now. So all of these Vicodin original products, 5 slash 500, 7.5 slash 750, etc., all of those products had to be remanufactured and can contain no more than 325 milligrams. That's not just true of hydrocodone products. It's any, any pain medication that also includes acetaminophen. So Vicodin, Lorco, and Nortab are really no different from one another other than Norco has a little more acetaminophen. Trace, I just kind of want to just point out that, you know, these are those kind of combination where the five milligrams, in this case, the hydrocodone is working centrally. That's those mu receptors, those delta kappas. And then the acetaminophen is out there working at those peripheral, out there where the trauma is creating that analgesic. So this is kind of that, 
you know, that synergistic effect where, you know, one plus one equals three rather than one plus one equaling two. So this is that kind of that combination of central versus peripheral here. Yeah, and there, you know, it, that's a great point because there, the rumor has always swirled around for decades, decades that, oh, if there's a combination product with acetaminophen plus an opioid, rather than a synergistic potential, it's more to kind of dissuade patients from abusing the opioid. In other words, they would think that an addict would say, oh, gosh, I don't really want to go over the max daily dose of acetaminophen, so I'll just take the recommended amount. I just won't get high. That never happens. The, the, the definition of addiction is compulsive use despite harm. So the real purpose of it is a benefit. Using the two together, you get that central and peripheral, and like Greg mentioned, that synergistic pain control. It's great and very effective in patients. Uh, nothing really additionally to add here for the hydrocodone. Most of this I already said. It moved from a Schedule 3 to a Schedule 2 in 2014, and I already mentioned 30 milligrams of oral morphine is equivalent to 20 milligrams of oxycodone. And 20 to 30 milligrams of hydrocodone, I always say 20 milligrams of hydrocodone because uh, that's just my personal experience with it with patients. Um, I think it's as potent as oxycodone. So then last on our list here of kind of true opioids is tramadol. It, it's kind of, you know, it, it's a different different side of the coin, so to speak, when you're looking at opioids. And it's another great choice for patients. This is a Schedule 4 substance as compared to the hydrocodone products that are Schedule 2 and codeine with acetaminophen that's a Schedule 3. So you have one in each category a Schedule 2, a Schedule 3, and a Schedule 4 if your DEA license allows that. Tramadol is brand name Ultram, and I, I should put next to that Tramadol Ultram is 50 milligrams. That's how it comes. Because when you compare it to the drug combo underneath it, Tramadol with 325 milligrams of acetaminophen, I'm just going to tell you that that combination, Tramadol is only 37.5 milligrams, and that's actually how it got approved with the new brand name, Ultraset. So I usually recommend if you're going to use tramadol and you want patients to mix it with acetaminophen, just have them use over-the-counter acetaminophen and you get much more dosing range with that and um, better pain control potential for sure. So you see here tramadol's dosing. It's usually given every six to eight hours, you know, one to two tablets, depending upon how severe the pain is. But tramadol does have a max daily dose, and it's usually between 340 to 400 milligrams per day. As compared to the other opioids that, you know, we said opioids by themselves have no max daily dose. Tramadol does. Tramadol has the max daily dose because it has a slightly different mechanism. Tramadol plugs into just mu receptors. All the other drugs that we've just talked about plug into mu, kappa, and delta receptors. Tramadol plugs into mu receptors only, along with some of our other CNS neurotransmitter receptors. This drug also increases serotonin and norepinephrine. So it's got this dual mechanism of action. The big downside, kind of twofold, there, it doesn't happen often, but you need to know that these exist. Tramadol can lower the seizure threshold. So if a patient has a seizure disorder or a patient is on another medication that can lower the seizure uh, the seizure threshold, like gabapentin. If somebody's using gabapentin for post-herpetic neuralgia, or somebody's using Lyrica pregabalin for post-herpetic neuralgia, or bipolar disorder, or anything, they don't have to be using an anti-seizure drug for a seizure to have this potential lowering of the seizure threshold with tramadol. It can happen to anybody. It's just more likely to occur if somebody has a seizure history or they're on another drug that can augment the seizure threshold like gabapentin or uh, pregabalin. Trace, let me throw out a couple of little optometry pearls here. And I think you kind of said it, but I just kind of want to hit it again. Um, yeah, I practice in Pennsylvania. We had uh, the hydrocodone. We don't have the hydrocodone fix yet. And so uh, when I started practicing, man, I loved using Darvacet, but then that started creating, I don't know, heart attacks or something along the line. And 
uh, we can't use Darvaset anymore. And okay, I moved over to uh, moved over to maybe Lore Tab, and uh, and then that was pulled because it got moved to Schedule Two. Really, coding doesn't really work real great on on, on ocular pain. Really, this tramadol is optometry's friend. And you know, I'll prescribe usually 50 milligrams, and I'll write for eight tablets. That's usually enough to get me over that two or three days. And I just kind of want to highlight what, what Tracy said here is, is you know, you could prescribe, you know, tell them to take some extra strength Tylenol, 500 milligrams up to three times a day because the upper dose is 3,000 3, milligrams a day of, of the acetaminophen. And you don't have to go to the ultra set, and it really doesn't work well, uh, the ultra set, for ocular pain because it's extended release. You want something that's gonna work quick. So that's why you wanna write really for all tram or not even, I even put that on there to make it confusing. I just write tramadol 50 milligrams, uh, write eight tablets, you know, one or two tablets, you know, every four to six hours for pain uh, and uh, hand the prescription uh, to the patient. So this here, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on because this one here is optometry's friend. And it's a, what, a schedule four out there. So yeah, yeah, schedule four. So that that also uh, makes it a little more beneficial because the addiction potential is lower. The only other thing I was going to mention is um, the, the the second part of that. You know, what are the potential problems that are different with tramadol compared to the other opioids? Is um, there's something called serotonin syndrome that is rare, very rare, but it can occur in patients who combine serotonergic agents. So any drugs that increase serotonin in the brain when you mix them together can potentially cause serotonin syndrome which is hard to describe and it usually is fatal um, you know it, it affects patients muscles they sort of you know feel mentally wonky and by the time somebody is assessing them many times they don't make it out of the other side so it's more important just to prevent it and know that it exists helps to prevent it so if you have a patient coming in on high dose Prozac and or uh, one of our triptans for migraine, so uh, Imitrex, Maxalt, that's Sumatriptan, Naratriptan, et cetera. Um, that's when you're gonna have to just kind of stop and think, oh, are those eight tablets over two to three days gonna be okay? And they might be. You certainly can combine them with Prozac. It's when you get into really high doses or you have three different serotonergic medications combined that we have to worry. And the pharmacy computer is going to pick that up as well. And if you're not sure, call call a pharmacist that you know or one that you don't know and, you know, start dialogue with them. They're uh, kind of, you know, your best friend when it comes to answering some of these questions. Tramadol is a Schedule 4. It was never a controlled substance in ske until Schedule, uh, excuse me, until 2014. Um, it's a, it was a little surprising that it wasn't a controlled substance from the beginning. It's been around for almost 20 years, uh, and it, we always knew it plugged into mu receptors. But the FDA and the DEA didn't really think it has addiction potential, but it does. So sometimes patients will just flat out abuse tramadol in high dose, or they will use it just so they don't go through with Withdrawal. So if they can't get their hands on oxycodone or heroin or whatever, you can take tramadol. It plugs the mu receptors and patients don't go through withdrawal or addicts don't go through withdrawal. And as a reminder, when that mu receptor gets uh, tickled, right, you get the euphoria. So. Yep. All right. Let's launch quest polling question uh, number two here. When you see a patient in your office on methadone, just be kind to them. Uh, because you know they're trying to recover from an opioid abuse or they have recovered from an opioid abuse so true or false you know every time you see someone on methadone just you know don't don't be oh they're an opioid addict so on and so forth um, just uh, you know just be kind and you know, you know that they're recovering from opioid abuse We got neck and neck here a little bit. Yeah, we see it. I don't think they can see it. And I think I forgot to click the little button to show the results here at the end. So uh, we'll give it another uh, you know, a couple seconds here. Uh, the, the drawback is I can't see how many people have uh, have weighed in. And uh, um, it looks like the numbers have slowed down. So I don't think I hit this uh, the, the little toggle switch on my end out there. Uh, to the audience that uh, it says that uh, uh, 
true is 60% and false is uh, uh, is about 40%. So I'm, I'm not going to dive into this. I'll let Tracy uh, kind of dive into the next few slides here. And uh, uh, we'll talk about why that question came up here. I think it's another slide after this, but I didn't want to let the cat out of the bag with this slide. <laughs> here, so. Well, it was kind of a trick question, and we'll talk about why. So on this slide, I just have miscellaneous opioids, and they're they're very deliberately put on the same slide, uh, mostly dealing with uh, opioid allergies. So we'll just talk about that briefly and what you have to be careful and, and look for in your patients if you're going to prescribe an opioid. But here we have fentanyl, the most there, uh, certainly nothing that you're going to need to be involved in from an acute patient uh, pain control perspective, but if a patient's on a duragesic patch as a chronic pain patient, you know, malignant or non-malignant chronic pain, that's our heaviest hitter. And, um, you know, we have to watch for drug interactions and uh, CNS depression, etc. Meperidine is brand name Demerol. If you're, uh, you know, in your 40s, maybe my age 50 and up, you might recognize this or remember it. Um, it's not popular anymore, uh, mainly because it has these toxic metabolites. So as the drug is bro broken down or metabolized in the body, these these baby drugs hang around and they can cause um, increased risk of addiction, drug seeking activity, and they can also cause sort of a dissociative type effect. So that doesn't sound like fun. And then we have methadone. And you might be surprised to see here at the bottom um, another star that's actually representing all three of these drugs typically reserved for morphine or codeine allergic patients. So we're going to kind of dig into that a little bit more briefly going forward. But suffice it to say that if somebody's listed as having a codeine allergy, and let's face it, everybody probably listening to this lecture, uh, unless you're maybe a brand new practitioner, uh, that you've heard of a codeine allergy. It's kind of, you know, the typical three or four, a penicillin allergy, a codeine allergy, a sulfa allergy, and maybe an aspirin allergy. And what holds all four of those together is the fact that those are all naturally occurring substances. So, that, you know, kind of lends some information uh, or kind of alludes to the fact that, yeah, these could be true allergies. But you also know that penicillin, you know, a lot of times isn't a true allergy. Sulfa is definitely almost always a true allergy. Aspirin is somewhere in between. But what about codeine? Why does codeine pop up as one of the most common allergies and not morphine? Morphine's natural. Well, more people get codeine. And, you know, every level of practitioner that can have a DEA license, um, you know, will prescribe the codeines and, you know, the, the tramadols, et cetera. The problem with listing a patient as having a codeine allergy, it's usually nausea and vomiting that, that is the allergy. It's not an allergy. It's just an intolerance. I, I just would like to tell you that if somebody is listed as being codeine allergic, it, it knocks out every single opioid in a pharmacy software system, both inpatient and outpatient. And you're going to get a call saying, well, I hate to break it to you, but your patient's listed as codeine allergic. The only drugs that they can take safely are fentanyl, meperidine, or methadone. So we just have to ask the right questions. Oh, I see you're allergic to codeine. What happens when you take codeine? Oh, it makes you vomit. Well, okay, I'm not going to give you codeine, but it's not really an allergy. So methadone, this is the, the slide that Greg was talking about a moment ago. You were right. Lots of patients that come in uh, on methadone, particularly if methadone is the only opioid, should be the only opioid in their drug list if they're using it for opioid use disorder. So if they're in a methadone treatment program, um, methadone is a great drug to kind of help uh, patients with withdrawal symptoms and to deter abuse. And I'll explain why briefly. But we also know now, and I'm a big advocate of methadone for chronic pain, Pain. Um, I, I uh, work occasionally with a physician friend of mine who um, was my chronic pain patient doctor about 20 years ago. I now have a spinal cord stimulator implanted. Um, but anyhow, he's a big proponent of methadone for chronic pain patients. And the reason is similar to why patients can use it when they are uh, experiencing opioid use disorder. You can see here uh, the second line says 
Methadone has a two-phase elimination. So you take it once per day if you're using it as an abuse deterrent. And over the course of 24 hours, that methadone just eliminates nicely all by itself in the patient's body. It lasts for 24 hours in receptors, doesn't make patients high, plugs the receptors, methadone just kind of sits there, and a patient doesn't go through withdrawal, which is part of the reason that they will go uh, and continue to have drug-seeking activity if they're experiencing the very uncomfortable uh, symptoms of withdrawal. It's not the only thing that will that will draw them back into abuse, um, but it's one of the biggies. But it's this two-phase elimination that also makes methadone a great drug for chronic pain. The difference is you can see the first hump or the alpha phase of the 24 hours is what is methadone's pain control time frame. The first eight hours after a methadone tablet, that's where you'll get pain control. The, le the next 16 hours, no pain control. So look at the two patients that I've given you here quickly that'll help you um, decide if a patient comes in and you notice that uh, they have methadone in their profile, this will help you ascertain whether or not they're using it for pain or for opioid abuse. Patient one is on methadone as, as well as a short acting opioid. So they're using methadone for basal control and they're using maybe MSIR or Percocet or Vicodin for breakthrough pain or acute pain. This means that patient is most likely being used, using methadone, excuse me, to treat chronic pain. You're gonna also notice that if a patient's using methadone for chronic pain, not only will they have another opioid short acting along with it, but they'll usually be taking methadone at least twice per day, sometimes three times per day. If somebody on the other hand is like patient number two, where they're only on methadone and it's gonna be lower doses than if they were using it for pain, you're also gonna notice that these patients using methadone for opioid abuse uh, as an opioid abuse deterrent, they're only taking it one time per day. It's also important to mention if somebody comes in on methadone, you have to figure out why they're on it if they're coming in for an ocular pain issue because if they are in a methadone treatment program we cannot legally give them a prescription nor can I legally dispense as a pharmacist any opioids so uh, anyhow that would be true of an emergency room they couldn't go into an emergency room and get pain meds so it's just kind of one more piece of the puzzle. Not that you would be very excited about handing out a, an opioid for acute pain you know, for an ocular indication if they're on methadone to begin with, but it's just another layer of the onion that we kind of peel back with some of these patient issues. I got excited. I get so excited about all my drug topics that I, I jumped ahead and gave you most of what you need to know about opioid allergies. But the biggest thing is kind of this middle star here that says you just have to ask the patient the appropriate question. Oh, I see you have a sulfa allergy. Can you tell me what happens when you take it? Oh, you have a codeine allergy. Can you tell me what happens when you take it? And, you know, most of the time, I would say it's greater than 90%, the patient will say, it makes me horribly nauseous or I vomit from it or I just, oh my gosh, I just, you know, roll and roll and roll. My stomach just turns. I had a patient say it gives them the, a wobbly wame. Didn't know at the time what that meant, but wobbly wame means kind of rolling nausea. Uh, anyhow, wobbly wame or full-blown vomiting, it's not an allergy uh, in most cases. So we want to make sure that we encourage the patient to not list that as an allergy and just remember it as an intolerance so that we can avoid uh, getting phone calls from a pharmacist saying, oh, guess what? You can't give tramadol because they're allergic to codeine. So it's, again, one more layer to kind of sort through. And we already said fentanyl, methadone, or meperidine. Do you have something to add, Greg? Uh, I'm just going to kind of jump in here. Dan has asked a question. Well, first, he's made a comment. Thanks, Dan. It says, great discussion. Then he has, how do you handle the issue of recurrent ocular conditions or refills? I'll let you take the refill side of that, um, Trace. I did reply to Dan uh, kind of privately here, and I said, you know, what recurrent condition are we talking about? So, you know, a couple things that run into my mind is, you know, post-herpetic neuralgia. Well, that's more of uh, neuropathic pain, so we're not going to be really using anything in the opioid arena here because it really doesn't work well. Um, I was thinking like recurrent corneal erosion. 
Um, I probably wouldn't be treating too many, you know, erosions uh, with, uh, you know, some type of opioid. Maybe um, the initial day or two, if it's just a huge, you know, bad epithelial basement membrane and they just have a huge abrasion, there might be an instance where we might be using uh, maybe a tramadol uh, a day or two, uh, 50 milligrams, just to kind of get them through if the, you know, on the pain scale, if they're up there pretty high. Um, a tysis bulby can become, uh, can become very painful and chronic. And that's a little bit of a tricky one because now we're moving in. That's trying to think of really, that's probably the only chronic pain that's out there. Someone may have gone for retinal detachment surgery, the retina totally detached, the eye kind of dies and, and then it can become painful over time. Um, probably at that point, you know, we'd probably be talking about a nucleation. Um, but, uh, you know, those are the types of things. Um, Dan replied back here. Let me just see. It says, hey, Greg, I'm curious what type of recurrent conditions would be appropriate for opioids or refills, uh, such as a scleritis. Um, you know, a scleritis is a whole other different type of lecture. Um, you know, that's usually something systemic going on, usually something rheumatologic. Um, I usually get them over to the rheumatologist to kind of one because probably 90 some percent, 95, 100% of the time, if they have a scleritis, it's probably related to something systemic in the rheumatological realm, get that diagnosed, and then that will take care of the chronic condition uh, re regarding the scleritis. Uh, but in the, in the short term, uh, it, it, scleritis are painful. Um, you could certainly, until you get them off to the rheumatologist, uh, you know, I'd probably use something like, at least in Pennsylvania, because I don't have anything that I can go stronger with, I would probably do some uh, acetaminophen, 1,000 milligrams, two or three times a day, along with uh, probably, in this case, uh, 100 milligrams, at least to start off with, of, of tramadol that's out there. Um, but in the case with, uh, with the scleritis, um, it's going to, you know, you, you want to get the uh, get this, the chronic condition taken care of, and then that will settle down the, the recurrence of it. Anything on the, the on the refills, Trace? Well, let's let's assume that there's something that, you know, that pops up in a patient, an optometric patient that we're not thinking of here, that maybe down the line does turn out to be a, a chronic issue. From a refill perspective, I, I would say, you know, just real, real quick off the top of my head, one thing that you will sometimes run into is you'll have a pharmacist call and say, um, you're an optometrist, you can't write for an opioid. I, I've seen that happen more times than um, than I can count. So, you know, they should have looked that up before they called you, but that, that might just be something you face occasionally. But the bigger issue is, or maybe it's not really an issue, it's just more information for you. Um, you know, you have a DEA license and you uh, are really going to be more bound, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but more bound by what your state laws allow for quantity and length of time a patient can be treated for pain with an opioid. So that's the thing that's going to really limit um, length of time and, and number of refills, number of tablets, capsules, etc. But just from a basic refill perspective, Schedule 2, even if you only gave them one day worth, no refills allowed. So if you think a patient is needing to be treated for five days, you know, it might, it might, uh, and you're allowed to do that according to your state DEA um, license. Um, you might want to give them, you know, the three, four, five days because no refills are allowed on Schedule 2 for anybody. Schedule 3 and 4 can have five refills. So not suggesting we always uh, or even often want to put refills on an opioid like tramadol or Tylenol with codeine, but they can have refills added and the prescriptions are good for six months. So just more kind of layers to all that. We had someone raise their hand to speak. Um, I'll just be disclosure here. Never really used the feature, but uh, Alicia, um, I, whether you hit the button maybe by accident or if not, I'm going to give you two seconds to kind of be ready here. I'm going to accept it, and you can ask uh, you can ask your question here. Um, let's see if it uh, what happens. It's a new feature. Um, I have it turned on. So, are you there, Alicia? Give it another second or two. And always got to love the technology that's out there. 
All right. So Alicia, if uh, you want to try it again in a few seconds here, I don't see the request anymore. And then I click accept. So uh, let me jump over here to the to the video uh, of assessing pain here. We'll start this video here. So pay attention to the pain scales and, and how they're used here. Fine. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your pain? Me. The poor captain has a splitting headache. We mustn't annoy him. When I say go, push against my back and we'll walk up the hill. Ready? Go. Ow! You did that on purpose. There's one that's a nine, Trace. Ah, alone at last. Huh? I am Prince Navin. There's a 10 for you, Trace. I will scan there you for go. injuries. All right. Let's go back to the slides there. So those are all found on YouTube. Uh, we did this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I think the most questions we had is, hey, where can I get those videos? So those are found <laughs> on YouTube. So. Yeah, and, and the funny thing, when Greg and I uh, first looked through those together, uh, watched the video, he, he and I were disagreeing with some of the, the numbers that, uh, you know, were, were suggested in the cartooning, um, which, you know, kind of goes to what we said already, which is it is a subjective process, and by adding the pain scale uh, that a patient can assess and, and using it from an objective, um, you know, perspective as much as we can, it helps us to assess a patient's pain appropriately. So with that, I promised that we would have these, um, these sort of categories and appropriate medications to use within those pain scale categories. So I told you earlier, mild pain is considered a one to three on the, the number scale. Great choices include acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen, a sodium, which is a leave, and tramadol, lower dose of tramadol. And then I just want to show you quickly, you're going to see crossover between these categories. Moderate pain, there's that tramadol again, but just higher dose. Tylenol with codeine, acetaminophen with oxycodone, so Percocet Vicodin. Now also keep in mind, and I'll show you you quickly here on a pain scale uh, like moderate pain or any of them really mild moderate or severe there's also a difference between the ranges so there there's a decided difference between a four and a six on the pain scale a six you couldn't sit comfortably and listen to this webinar and participate in it you'd have to get up you you, you would be uncomfortable uh, you'd be agitated it would be a real problem and you wouldn't be able to put up with a six on the pain scale for very long without seeking help a four you probably could make it through this this uh, webinar discussion, you would be uncomfortable, but you'd probably be able to make it through. So we have to adjust our medications according to that thinking as well. And then our, our severe pain, seven to nine or 10 on the scale, 
again, you can use Vicodin, you can use Percocet, morphine, hydromorphone, and then there's our fentanyl. So we have crossover. This is just one set of guidelines listing the medications, but it, it just sort of sets the stage for appropriate categories. I mean, there are some people who take tramadol for severe pain and get at least enough mileage out of it that it takes the edge off. And that's wholly appropriate if a patient can, um, you know, kind of exist that way. I wasn't sure where you were going with that. If you were going to say after being on this presentation, it would be a six. I wasn't sure what the... <laughs> All right, so we're going to launch this next question. I do see that I have a tick that we can show the display of results here. So uh, this next polling question is, one of the main problems with opioids is that it has uh, a low ceiling effect, a high ceiling effect, or there is a lack of a ceiling effect. So one of the main problems out there is low ceiling with opioids, high ceiling, or there is no ceiling uh, with opioids. You kind of talked about this a little bit, Trace, uh, but it's always good to kind of go back and, and revisit. And uh, uh, the numbers are dropping on the, the low ceiling effect. We have high ceiling effect being out there kind of in second place and lack of ceiling effect and kind of kind of winning. Yeah, it looks like the lack of a ceiling effect is winning the poll. All right, so I'm going to end the poll, and you guys will see that it's about 62% uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of of the people say lack of, and high is 22%, and low ceiling effect is about 14%. So Trace, why don't you take that? So it, it does kind of go back to what we were saying when uh, when we first looked at morphine and I said there is no maximum daily dose. It's also called a ceiling effect and it's important to mention here just because we have other agents so that we're encouraging you to use instead of or along with an opioid. So uh, it says here commonly used when discussing analgesics. This phenomenon is pertaining to or referencing when a drug reaches a maximum effect and then once it reaches that maximum effect Effect, then you get oh, wow. no additional benefit That's from it, but just additional side effects. So for instance, if you were, if you were a patient who was going to use um, ibuprofen at 6,000 milligrams per day, which is almost double the max daily dose, you would get great analgesic potential, but the side effects could potentially be deadly. Same with acetaminophen. Whereas the opioids, except for tramadol, tramadol is a ceiling drug or a ceiling effect as well. But all the other opioids that we've looked at tonight have no ceiling. So you can continue to get pain control and analgesia uh, as we up the dose. Does that also increase side effect potential, particularly death? Yeah, it does. But you also do continue to get analgesic control, uh, increased analgesic potential or control, and um, euphoria or that high patients get. Let me point out here is that I, I always like using aspirin. We don't really use aspirin uh, too much for the analgesic effect, but I like talking about it because, you know, if we give low dose aspirin, it gives uh, antiplatelet activity and uh, really no analgesic effect. And then you give it a little higher dose and then you start getting some uh, analgesic effects, some um, antipyretic effect. And then at the highest dose, you start getting the anti-inflammatory. So in these types of medications, you know, you could keep giving it more and more and more, but you just run out of that analgesic effect. That happens with, in a sense, the peripheral acting, but it doesn't happen with the, uh, uh, with the central acting or these opioids. And that's when we can start getting ourselves in the problem is that they keep trying to use it to get the high, they try to get the pain, and then all of a sudden the, the side effect comes up here, which is just the bad side effect that we most know of. I think we have a polling question coming up here. Um, looks like uh, we had a little background noise there. Looks like Alicia has joined the room. I did mute her there. Alicia, do you want to, did you have a comment? I'm going to unmute you here. Um, or maybe she did leave the room. Uh, maybe that was just a bump. So, uh, um, Okay, so we'll just keep moving on here. All right, so this is polling question number four here. 
and uh, we kind of alluded to it, and I'm going to publish it here, is that, you know, what kills the patient when taking too many opioids? So uh, if they take too many, is it the allergic reaction uh, that's out there? Is it, uh, you know, we do know the side effect of opioids is constipation. So is it the uh, constipation and then bowel rupture? Is it because they thin the blood out too much and they just get a bleed out? Or is it the respiratory depression that's out there? And uh, you could see. Parties. I think I think we got it here. I think we've seen enough of our of our friends and maybe even families uh, take uh, uh, or, or or know what happens with these patients. So we'll just end the poll here real quick, and you can see everyone kind of nailed it here with the respiratory depression. Trace, why don't you talk about the adverse drug effects with these opioids? So just going back to the comment that both Greg and I made that we have opioid receptors head to toe and everywhere in between. And then we looked at the specific locations briefly where we had the mu receptors with analgesia, constipation, respiratory depression, euphoria, euphoria et cetera. Um, that's what I say about drugs all the time. And that is you cannot get the good without the bad. So I also mentioned previously that you don't always know that you're having a side effect internally. You take ibuprofen and you might feel great on it, but you don't realize that your, you know, vascular perfusion of your kidneys is diminished somewhat because it's not enough for you to be able to see it, but it's occurring. Or micro GI bleed when you're taking ibuprofen or aspirin. You may not know the first 75 times you take it, but then it might rear its ugly head. Very similar with the opioids, and they really are sort of the poster child uh, as a group for representing you get, you can't just have the good with none of the bad. Everybody on an opioid will get constipation. The exception to that is tramadol. Some, most people get it with tramadol, but it's not quite as uh, severe or across the board. Um, but just to, just to kind of drive home the point here, if you've ever had diarrhea, we don't have to ask, use that in a polling question, but if you've ever had diarrhea, you probably took Imodium which is loperamide. That is a baby brother of an opioid, levomethorphan, which isn't a very common one that we use anymore. Um, but, but how does it work? Well, we, we learned that morphine initially caused constipation and people in opioid dens constipation. And essentially they changed it structurally enough so that it would just plug into um, receptors below the blood brain barrier. But you can get high on Imodium. I'm not suggesting that you try it, but you can find blogs about that as well. So that's where we take something where we know a drug is plugging into a receptor and we use it for good. So this constipation comment uh, is more to just tell you that if you have like you know Greg with his eight tablets of tramadol that's kind of his standard for certain ocular indications you know it would be worth him mentioning to patients you know some people on tramadol do have problems with constipation but not everybody so keep an eye on it if you notice an issue you can take something to stimulate peristalsis etc but all the other opioids other than tramadol, absolutely cause constipation. So if you're going to use Tylenol with codeine or Vicodin for one or two or three days, I always suggest this product. Um, patients should receive a stool softener, docusate, plus a stimulant, Senna, um, is the most common one. And for two bucks or $2.63 exactly, you can get a bottle of 100 tablets. Is it way more than they need? Yeah, but that's as small as it comes. So they should take that while they're on the opioid, even if it's just a few days, and then for a couple of days after. Uh, and that really helps prevent this really pretty horrible problem that occurs with the opioids. You can get itching from opioids. It's more common with intravenous forms, but it's worth mentioning because because we worry about potential allergy. So it's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind when somebody says they have a morphine or a codeine allergy. Um, some of it is just, you know, physiologic to the mechanism, but if there's rash or anything to do with the eyes, you know, swelling of the eyelids, nose itching, mouth itching, you know, respiratory constriction, that, those are obviously deal breakers. Here's that nausea and vomiting. Codeine pops up as the most common because it's used a lot. And 
and also because codeine plugs most profoundly. It has the greatest affinity to this BARF center, as I colloquially call it, our chemoreceptor trigger zone. So if a patient barfs from codeine, well, they'll probably do just fine on a different opioid and maybe a codeine base like hydrocodone or oxycodone. So codeine is the worst offender there. Sedation, uh, sometimes that's the good part of, of taking these as well, but sedation does wear off. They become tolerant to that. We see inhibition of cough reflex, confusion, euphoria, dysphoria, and there's our meiosis. People on high dose uh, opioids get that pinpoint pupil, and then the respiratory depression. It's a very insidious problem because um, it, it's a centrally nerve, central nervous system based respiratory depression. So a patient, you know, takes, you know, just one extra Percocet because their pain's bad. They took their one Percocet and it's not working enough. So they think, oh, it's just one more. It can't hurt me. Well, that patient might be one Percocet away from um, their brain telling their lungs to quit working. So it's a huge thing to keep in mind. Uh, we did talk a little bit about opioid withdrawal, and I don't have too much to add there, but it is most acute with short-acting agents. So the immediate release products are going to cause the most acute withdrawal symptoms uh, in a patient who's abusing these medications. And it's just kind of uh, something to say, um, that if you asked a group of addicts, would you rather use a long acting product like Oxycontin and swallow it? Or would you rather, because it'll last most of the day, or would you rather have Percocet um, that's immediate release? And, you know, dimes to donuts, they're going to say they want the immediate release because it gives a higher peak in their blood system, gets them high faster. Uh, but it also causes worse with for sure. I meant so I'm just going to reiterate, you just have to watch the drug interactions with our opioids. And that's why, you know, Greg and I really emphasized at the beginning, you have to know the drug list and what they're taking for neuropathic pain or, or even other indications, central nervous system depressants. So mixing our opioids with alcohol or benzodiazepines like Xanax, Valium, uh, muscle relaxers, sleep agents, even antihistamines, you get that additive central nervous system depression. Some of them are deadly combos. Some of them you just sleep, you know, more deeply. So, um, you know, always call a pharmacist and ask if you're not sure or you're uncomfortable. There's, there's no downside to asking, and it saves a patient. And, and another, you know, optometry's role is I bet you once or twice a year I'll have someone come in and reviewing the – I always hound my staff to get the most updated. I don't care if it's a glaucoma patient that I just put on Lumigan and I'm seeing them back in two weeks just to check their IOP, any new medications that are out there. And I can't tell you, you know, after doing these lectures, and that's why I like doing them and lecturing with Tracy – is that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, someone was using something to sleep and then they hurt their back and they have all these medications, they have their own pharmacy at home. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm having a tough time sleeping because, uh, you know, I hurt my back. So then I have this Percocet that when I had my carpal tunnel syndrome and, you know, surgery done. And then, you know, they come in and you see that they're taking this like who put you on this? Well, I was having trouble sleeping, so I took this sleep aid. And I, I'm, and just like Tracy said, you know what? You might be like one pill away from stop breathing. So, you know, that's another important reason to like everyone to be on this on this you know, webinar tonight is to kind of learn that. And you might stop someone from having to maybe go on this opioid antagonist uh, just because they just kind of had their own medications at home and was trying to treat their own, you know, sleep uh, problem and their pain. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I can, probably once or twice, you know, I'll pick that up like, really, do you think you should be on that? Be careful and get them off to their PCPs to kind of figure out you know, what they need to do then. And also ask them if they take other, you know, when you, if you're going to prescribe an opioid, any drugs of abuse that they might be using, or you know, people take other people's medications all the time. So uh, that that's a good a good point about uh, always having an updated list, Greg. 
So we have these opioid antagonists that you've heard of, uh, so, you know, maybe you just read about them in the newspaper because it's it's a bit of a hot button issue right now in, in a good way, uh, in the sense that they're becoming more widely available. But also because if you followed the death of Prince or the death of Michael Jackson, you uh, or even Demi Lovato, she didn't die, but she didn't die because somebody had uh, Narcan nearby. So if you look at the structure of morphine, th this is the stuff I dream about because I'm, I'm a chemistry geek, but look at the structure of morphine and then compare it right next to the, the, the uh, picture is naloxone. Naloxone is Narcan. And it just shows you that it doesn't take a whole lot of difference in structure to take um, a, a, a pure agonist and make it into a pure antagonist. And both of these drugs fit into those mu kappa delta receptors beautifully. The difference is which one came first sometimes and which one is in a higher concentration in the bloodstream. So naloxone or Narcan and then another one that is available inpatient only, naltrexone, Revia. So naloxone, Narcan is not only available by injection, but right now it's really being pushed um, for, you know, most healthcare facilities, uh, most primary care offices, maybe even optometry will be part of this, that you should have it on hand just in case a patient comes in uh, and is overdosing. And it's a nasal spray. So these drugs are remarkable because they have uh, also the ability to be mixed with another agent to be used therapeutically. So let me show you what I mean by that. We have this agonist antagonist combinations also for the treatment of opioid abuse addiction. So we already mentioned methadone. That's one of the drugs that we can use as an opioid use deterrent. But then we also have this combination. Buprenorphine, Buprenex, is by itself, it's a single chemical, but it is a mixed agonist antagonist. And what I mean by that is the activity of buprenorphine in the opioid receptors is such that it causes a little bit of agonist activity, but also some antagonist activity. So you're not really going to see many people choosing buprenorphine as their drug of abuse of choice because it doesn't give you that much of a high. We do know that people can abuse it. So it hasn't really been popular because why do we need another drug of abuse? So then scientists said, and, and the medical community said, well, what if we mix the buprenorphine along with Narcan? And voila, there we have Suboxone, and now we have Suboxone treatment centers. So sometimes patients who don't do well on methadone, it doesn't work for them for their opioid uh, use disorder they do well on Suboxone. And Suboxone is literally buprenorphine plus naloxone, and it turns into what we call an opioid agonist, antagonist, plus antagonist. And it's fascinating pharmacology. It is a Schedule three product um, in the controlled substance schedule, and patients can abuse it, for sure. It, you know, with, the, with an addiction, there is a way. Just a couple quick definitions and then we'll get to cases and some questions. We're, we're really great on time here. Tolerance is increase in dose to maintain effect. And it's important to give you this definition because if you ever have to take uh, an opioid as a pain patient chronically or, uh, you know, even for just a few weeks, if it may not be in perpetuity, but even for just a few weeks, understand that your body becomes tolerant. Your pain becomes tolerant to that use of the same dose of an opioid. So if a patient is taking, you know, one Percocet every every six hours for pain, after a week or two or three, they're going to notice, wow, that, that one Percocet every six hours isn't getting the job done anymore. So their pain specialist might say, well, you know, move it to every four hours or start taking two or one and a half every six hours. And that's normal. It's just the way the receptors sort of downregulate. So that person has tolerance, which is increase in use or increase in dose, excuse me, or escalation of dose of Percocet to maintain pain control. What if uh, that patient's sibling is, is stealing some of their Percocet to get high? Well, that person's going to see the same effect. It's called tolerance in them as well. It's just that that person who's an addict has to have an escalation of dose to maintain euphoria or getting high. So it's not always a mark of addiction, but it can be.
And then last thing here, just in terms of those definitions, is true addiction, or it's what we used to call psychological dependence. Is It is a disease. It's not really a choice other than, you know, the choice being I'm going to go seek help to, to, to be treated for my opioid use disorder. Um, but there are, there are genetics involved here. There's, you know, brain chemistry. There are lots of different factors to um, true addiction. But the definition of it is compulsive use despite harm. The patient's life is not made better by continual use of these opioids. And um, the only other thing I'd mention is, you know, if somebody comes in with an ocular pain issue and they have a substance abuse history, um, you know, just make sure you understand what drugs can have cross addiction potential or maybe trigger addiction in a patient who's had a substance abuse uh, problem. Not everybody agrees that it should be across the board. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have a patient who was an amphetamine addict. So they either smoked crystal methamphetamine or they abused Adderall or an Adderall-like type substance. Those are uppers. And, you know, some patients like only uppers, um, and that's their addiction issue. They could potentially take an opioid, which is a downer, um, without an addiction problem. Some patients would abuse both. So, you know, there's a lot of different science and questions we have to ask uh, of our patients. And then uh, kind of winding up, what I have here is just, you know, uh, we always say just avoid getting bullied. You know, you're the you're the one with the DEA license and the optometry license. You, patients come in, you know, not only uh, addicts, but even just patients who think, well, I paid a fifty dollar copay to see you, and darn it, if I'm not going to leave with a prescription of some type. So, you know, there are some patients who just bully us into uh, doing things that maybe we wouldn't necessarily want to do. Certainly, as it pertains to opioids, we have to avoid that. We have these great databases. Um, the, the most common is called the PDMP, Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. And any patient you write a prescription for that is an opioid or a controlled substance, you absolutely should look in the PDMP. Uh, it's free to sign up and you just need the patient's name and date of birth and you'll have every controlled substance that they've taken um, over, I think it's up to 42 states, every practitioner, how they paid for it, et cetera. And it just protects you. Anything to add there, Greg? Well, I kind of probably don't remember me adding this slide. And Oh, uh, I didn't. Yeah, um, this here is a prescription monitoring program and I have an Oklahoma license and you can see here that the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs Control received uh, assistance for the PMP to start integrating it into the electronic health records. Uh, so uh, yeah, so some really cool stuff out there happening with this prescription monitoring uh, program. Um, I do have that Oklahoma license, but uh, also uh, Pennsylvania is constantly, you know, as you can see here, this is from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Now, this one on this first slide talks about chronic pain and requires the prescribers to assess whether, you know, the patient is taking or currently taking any controlled substances and so on and so forth. But you can see, Chase, it goes back to your point. You know, the states are, you know, you kind of just have to know what your state is and, and all the different laws and you'll get emails because, again, uh, this is a crisis that's out there and, and there's a lot of uh, focus on it, as as we all know. Uh, but this whole point, this whole lecture is not to scare you. This is to empower you in a sense to go out and use these medications because we don't want you not to use them. Well, the states fought hard to get us these privileges. Um, so we want you to feel comfortable with it. And we also want you to be able to, again, not be bullied and and just, you know, use your license at its fullest uh, uh, capabilities. With that being said, every time you read state law, they, you have to, in these types of requirements, you have to kind of show alternatives out there. And one of the bigger alternatives out there that we always hear about is you know, the CBD. Trace, you want to talk you know, a couple slides on CBD and where that is? Because you know, we always, every time we do this, we always get, where does CDB, CBD fit in? So you want to talk about that real quick? Sure. We, we just, you know, decided to, um, you know, make sure that just to kind of complete the entire circle of pain management, we've mentioned NSAIDs, acetaminophen, our opioids, etc. You know, CBD is becoming really popular because it is uh, not the same as marijuana in terms of its pharmacology. And therefore, the, um, the laws governing it are state to state, but it is... Um, 
uh, it is legally available, and I think 49 of 50 states, Idaho is the only one that it, in no way, shape, or form is it allowed. So it's one of those things, it really wholly depends upon our genotyping, and our genotyping is sort of our, our chemistry or our pharmacogenetics telling us, you know, what receptors work for a patient, are they upregulated, downregulated, et cetera. But if you have the appropriate CBD receptors, you may be a good candidate for CBD products, uh, cannabidiol, to manage pain, anxiety, sleep, that type of thing. Um, it's different than marijuana because you can see here just across the bottom, hemp, which is CBD, uh, where CBD comes from, is not psychoactive, whereas marijuana is. So, you know, it, it might be a choice for patients, and, and I'm a CBD fan in a lot of my patients. And then I just had to also throw in, just because CBD is not psychoactive doesn't mean it can't have side effects. So we have to watch liver function tests, drows drowsiness, dizziness, particularly uh, with all of these if patients are taking super high doses, diarrhea, dry mouth, hypotension, increase in intraocular pressure, and change in appetite. So it's usually really well tolerated, but I always tell patients you start low and increase slowly. And if there's no benefit seen after a week or two, you're just not going to be a good candidate for CBD products. So in, in going with the alternatives for pain, we're going to talk quickly about NSAIDs. We kind of talked about them, the COX-2 inhibitors, corticosteroids, and there are some integrative approaches out there with acupuncture. Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, synergy. But from an eye standpoint, I think, you know, we all got to remember as an alternative that you have the bandage contact lens with the CPT code out there of the 92071. So there's an alternative for you. Uh, steroids, uh, don't, be a, uh, don't, don't forget that that's an alternative uh, out here, uh, the Medrol dose pack. Uh, that's that's here. Trace, you want to talk about how that's kind of used as, as in a sense and how it made it to the list? Uh, well, ju I just wanted to show you that there's a, a fairly new product that, that kind of mimics the Medrol dose pack. It's called the Millipred dose pack. Uh, don't fall into the trap. It's between four and five hundred bucks and you don't get any benefit from using it. It's just prednisolone, which is a little bit different than methylpred, but it's the same dosing. So if you see it and you're like, ooh, new and improved, you know, dose pack, don't fall into the trap. Mm -hmm. And then uh, adverse reactions with, uh, with steroids. I think we're all kind of familiar. We just put them in here for completeness. And we do have a handout, which I did launch. Um, acetaminophen, just a great uh, uh, used by itself, along with ibuprofen, which I want to get to the slide coming up here, uh, where you can kind of use them together. We talked about this synergy here, and on this picture, you can start seeing that ibuprofen on the picture over the counter is 200 milligrams. Acetaminophen comes in 325, 500, 650. Um, what I want to point out is on this next slide right here, where I have the APAP of 3,000 highlighted in red. It used to be 4,000. Um, they lowered it down to 3,000 a day, and the ibuprofen is 3,200 milligrams. Um, and you could use them together. Two and two is what I like to call it. Two ibuprofen, two Tylenol. Patients get confused sometimes. Should I take the two, wait four hours? The answer is no. You want to take all four pills, or in the bottom case there, where you see four ibuprofen, and two Tylenol, you want to take all six pills at the same time. And you heard Trace talk about, uh, about morphine. And its studies have shown taking ibuprofen and Tylenol together reaches the threshold of morphine. It just doesn't stay there for the longest time, but it can get to the levels of morphine. So I like two and two because you have to be real careful because I don't want them to get four and two and take the four Tylenol and just two ibuprofen. So if I ever do four ibuprofen and two Tylenol, and it could be because I want to treat some inflammation, right? Because at 800 milligrams uh, of that, that would be 200 times four, 800 milligrams, you get the analgesic and the uh, anti-inflammatory. So I do do ibuprofen four and two at, and the Tylenol two times. Just be careful that they don't get them reversed and they're taking the, the higher dose of the Tylenol because it can cause the liver uh, issues that are out there. With that, we fought hard. You heard me say it. This course is given not to avoid opioids. It's to feel empowered and safe and use them. So please do not avo avoid the opioids. 
out there. Our state associations are the only ones that can go out there and get you and expand our scope of practice. So they fought hard, get a DEA, uh, and it makes us like real docs, right? So we're not part of the problem. So I still carry a DEA because I do prescribe, you know, tramadol from time to time. Even if I don't write it in a year, I would still carry it because it does help the state associations go out and show that we can be responsible and, and it helps expand our scope of practice. Now, let me just show you a couple of real quick cases. This here is a corneal burn. A uh, patient touched their eye with a curling iron um, and just was in a ton of pain here. There's some barbecued, well done epithelium, a little S char there. We use some tramadol or some opioid. Now, this patient came in, you know, they had a, a big, uh, 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 a lot of pain, high tolerance of pain. I'm going to try this. Look right here. See this little cut right here? That is where the patient's uh, problem is. And I really wasn't sure, but then I decided to do an OCT on this patient. And you can see right here, here's the full thickness. This patient went almost two thirds of the way down. Here's the cut right here. Um, they were using something really sharp, a razor blade, basically gave themselves an RK incision. You can see why they're in so much pain. You can start to see the inflammation around this already starting to form. This was the case here where I did use an opioid type of, and you can see how deep it went, and that's why this patient. So that's why pain scales are important, in assessing the patient and uh, cutting all those corneal nerves. As we know, the cornea is one of the most, or is the highest dense populated uh, of nerves in the, in the body, and that's why the patient. Another unfortunate patient here using a screwdriver to fix their brakes, and you can see a nice little almost LASIK flap right here. You can see all the staining going around here because the, 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 the fluorescein's being pulled into the eye, and, uh, uh, and this patient uh, was not as deep. I don't have the OCT in here. They didn't go as deep, but they did uh, hit their cornea and the screwdriver went up into the upper fornix. They had a nice big conjunctival laceration. So this patient needed a little bit of uh, some tramadol or some opioid along with some acetaminophen to help treat their ocular pain. And this is a person that went for a DSEC, never really followed up and had a, a nice endoptomitis. And until we got him back to the ophthalmologist, the corneal surgeon, we did put them on some pain management to, to help them out. So really, this is the last polling question, and uh, we'll see if there's any uh, time for some quick questions. I know we're right about the, where we want uh, to be to, to meet the regulations of, of, of the 50-minute hours. So let me publish it real quick for everyone that's out there. Despite not needing to use opioids that uh, often in optometric care, is it still important to have a DEA number? So is it still important out there to have a DEA number? And you guys have heard me say it, and I said it a little bit earlier, we fought hard, and I'm glad everyone's answering true here on this. Um, I'll end the polling question and reset it, and we'll go back to the slides. And I think that's the last slide. Um, looks like there might be a question here kind of rolling in. Um, can you also discuss organic hemp use, anti-inflammatory? I've seen it used with organic turmeric and ginger. Uh, can you make any comments on that, Tracy? So you're you're very, uh, speaking very specifically, I would imagine, about CBD that comes from hemp, not hemp as a food source, um, which is also a good choice. But yeah, I'm a I'm a great, uh, huge component uh, proponent, both personally and professionally, of CBD, um, which I use occasionally. But I I take um, fairly high doses of ginger, of turmeric. Um, uh, quercetin, et cetera. And from an anti-inflammatory perspective, along with even fish oil, they can be great choices for patients with autoimmune disease and other inflammatory conditions. Um, and in the case of, of me personally, the use of those is what got me off of Remicade, methotrexate, and Plaquenil. So yeah, there's a lot of information out there. Certainly you can email me if you want more information about, you know, personally what I've done. And our cell phones and email addresses are on the handout. I think the handout is still 
an active file to be downloaded. Yeah, I still have it up there to be shared. Trace, I'll take this one here from George. Jack here, I see, says, uh, thanks for a thorough review of opioid pharmacology and use. Jack, thank you for the comment. It's our pleasure to be able to do this. Uh, George asks, what's the daily dose for ibuprofen and Tylenol combined? The key is that what I had highlighted there in red, uh, George, is that it's, uh, it's real easy, 800 times four, which is 800, per, uh, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, because that's prescription strength, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, times four is 3,200 milligrams, which means if you get over-the-counter uh, Advil and it's 200 milligrams, it can take 16 a day. So that's where the two and two comes from, the two ibuprofen or the four, which would be 800 milligrams of the ibuprofen. So 3,200 milligrams of ibuprofen. And remember, Tylenol used to be 4,000, now it's 3,000. I usually tell the patient to get 500 milligrams of ibuprofen, take two, that's 1,000, and it'll allow 3,000. So they could do that three times along with either you know, two Tylen or two ibuprofen or, or four ibuprofen, the two and two, or the four and two. Again, 3,200 milligrams of ibuprofen, 3,000 of the acetaminophen. And you can do that uh, up to three times a day. It works really, really well for ocular pain. That's out there. That and the bandage contact lens does a great job. And real quick, um, I know we're winding up here, but for those who have those questions, the table that Greg and I had um, embedded in the lecture with the, the acetaminophen and ibuprofen, that came from a review of optometry manuscript that we authored together September 2019. I think it was September 2019. Doesn't that sound right, Greg? It does, yes. Uh, so anyhow, there's lots of tables in there very specifically talking about all the different choices for pain and dosing and all of that. I was going to try and skip back to it. The program's not the easiest to skip back. So um, I'm just going to say thanks, everyone, for this is the table right here that Tracy was referencing in the magazine. Um, I thought maybe it might be on there. I thought we might have a reference. But I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, anytime we lecture, we hope that it makes your next day in, in, in practice uh, better. Trace, any final comments? And Joe, I know you're still on the line there. Um, are there any final comments coming from you as kind of help hosting this tonight? So, Tracy? No, no, no final comments, but there's one question that got skipped over by Cynthia, and it's, do you, do you need a DEA license to access the PDMD database? No, no, mm -mm, no, absolutely not. Nope. Okay. Nope. Just want to make sure we didn't miss that one. Yep. That's Sorry. Uh, oh, but there it is down there. I see it. Sorry, Cynthia. I see it down there now. Yeah. Do you need a DEA to access the... The patient. No, you do not. So. <clears throat> well, great, All right. great job, guys. Thank uh, you. Here's a great uh, presentation. Hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully, we're looking forward to hearing and seeing everybody safe, of course, getting back to a new normal or maybe at some of our future webinars. So, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.